All right, it's a little bit past time. We'll go ahead and get started. Uh, Ed is up in Spring Hills this evening, uh, for part of their summer series, and uh, so he's asked for me to fill in in his place tonight. We will be studying from the, uh, doing a snapshot of the book of Isaiah. Did everyone get one of the papers? They are out in the foyer if you did not get one. Uh, so there are more out there. And bring a handful out, Connie. You all right? Yes. <laughs> okay. All right. Let's go to God in a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we're thankful for the blessings that you've given to us. We're thankful for the rain that you are sending. It helps to replenish our water supply and helps to nourish our plants and clean our air for us. We pray, dear Holy Father, that the rain will not be so severe that it will cause injuries. Pray that you'll be with those who are on the road traveling, that they will slow down and, and be safe. We pray, dear Holy Father, that you'll be with those of our number that are not able to be with us this evening. We pray that if it's for physical health, that you will heal them. Pray that if it was for, for a spiritual reason, that we would give them a call and encourage them, let them know that they were missed and that we would like to have them here with us. We pray that you will be with us now as we go into this study, that we will be able to glean those things that you would like us to learn from your word. We're thankful that you have provided it so that we can know how you deal with your people, how much you love us, care for us. We can read about your, your grace and your mercy. We are thankful for, for both of those and for the love that Jesus had for us and to be willing to pay the price for the mistakes that we've made in our lives by shedding his blood that washes away our sins. And we ask that you forgive us of our sins. And it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. All right, so we're studying the book of Isaiah. Uh, this, this brings us into a new set of, of books. Uh, we had just completed the, uh, the, uh, the books of poetry. Anybody remember how many books of poetry there are? Y'all y'all know how the Bible's broke down? You got the first 5 books of the Old Testament are the books of law. Okay? So you got 5 books Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. All those are books of law. Uh, and they'll have in there the uh, the instructions that God gives to us uh, talks about the creation and God's plan. And then after the first books or five books of law, then the next group of books are history. And how many books of history are there? There are 12 books of history. So we've got five books of law, uh, 12 books of history. And then we go back to five books of poetry again. Okay, so it's five, twelve, five. And then the next uh, group of books 
is what we call the major prophets. Anybody know how many books of major prophets there are? Five. It's all either five or twelve. Okay, so we got five books of law. We've got twelve books of history. Then we've got five books of poetry. And then five books of major prophets. So how many books of minor prophets are there? Twelve. <laughs> it's, it's five or twelve. Okay? But it, it, and it almost goes in order. You'll go five books of law, twelve history, five poetry, five major prophets, and twelve minor prophets. What's the difference between the major prophets and the minor prophets? Anybody know? Is it important? I mean, is it is the size of the book? Okay, it's how much they wrote. You know, the the more they wrote, we classify them as the major prophets, and then the minor prophets wrote less. It's not that what they wrote was less important, or that they were a less important prophet. It's just that their writings were small. Okay. Has everyone got one of the snapshot sheets? Okay. Uh, so who's the author of the book of Isaiah? Isaiah is. Okay. And he claims that in Isaiah 1.1. 1, 1. Okay. Like we mentioned a, a second ago, this is, we are beginning the, the pro, books of prophecy, uh, the prophetic books. Uh, Isaiah being the first one in that group. Uh, this is the last section of the Old Testament uh, that is all prophecy from here on. Now, is it chronological? No. Okay. Uh, the section... Uh, is divided into two major sections, the major and minor prophets. We talked about that, the designation having little to do with importance, but rather the length of the writing. Uh, facts of Isaiah. The book of Isaiah covers the periods from 745 uh, to 680 B.C. Uh, so to put that in a timeline as we're thinking about it, if we remember back... To when you know the, the we had the the nation of Israel is divided into two groups, two kingdoms, right? You got the northern kingdom and you've got the southern kingdom. Okay, so which which kingdom was captured first? Anybody know? Northern kingdom was captured first. Okay, so the northern kingdom was captured and then the southern kingdom. Northern kingdom, bonus points here. Who, what uh, nation captured the uh, northern kingdom? Assyria. Okay, Assyria captured the northern kingdom and that was in approximately 721 B.C. So we see here that the writings of Isaiah covers from 741 to 680 B.C. So uh, that's a, which is about 25 years before the Assyrian captivity until about 40 years after it. Isaiah was contemporary with Hosea, Micah, and Nahum. All right. Uh, would this, you know, we said that it goes from 745 to 680. What about the southern kingdom? Has, during that time period, has the southern kingdom been captured yet? No. Uh, that was about 605. And we remember which, which nation came in and took over the southern kingdom? So that would have been the Babylonian kingdom or nation. Okay? So Isaiah's writings are from 745 to 680. 25 years into his writing, we've got the capture of the northern kingdom. And uh, 
then much later or, or you know, basically 55 years after uh, this, these writings, we have the southern kingdom being captured, or no, 75 years afterwards. Okay. Uh, his prophecy was confined primarily to the southern kingdom of Judah. Uh, character is mainly prophetic, but certainly historic as well. Uh, the beginning parts of the book are more historic in nature. The end of Isaiah uh, gets more into the prophetic part of it. It has the same number of chapters as the Bible has. How many, how many books are there in the Bible? 66. So there's 66 chapters in the book of Isaiah. Uh, it's also divided into two main divisions. And the first 39 chapters, how many books are there in the Old Testament? 39. And the New Testament? 27. Total of 66. Okay. Isaiah is, is actually called the, the mini Bible. Because it has the same number of chapters as the whole Bible. The first 39 chapters uh, are mainly uh, historic. The last ones are, uh, the last 27 books are prophetic or, or more prophetic. Uh, let's see, notice as well the number of chapters is the same number of books, okay. And it has uh, 1,292 verses. Uh, the key chapter is chapter 53, and what is chapter 53 known for? Talking about his suffering, right? Okay, so go ahead and turn over to Isaiah chapter 53, and let's read a, a few of these verses. Beginning at verse 1, who has believed what he has heard from us, and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he grew up before him like a young plant, and like a root out of dry ground. He had no form or majesty that we should look at him, and no beauty that we should desire him. Okay, so here it's talking, of, this is a prophecy about Jesus, and it's saying that he's, he's not going to be some great looking guy that everyone you know, admires because of his great looks. Uh, he was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief, and as one from whom men hide their faces. He was despised and we esteemed him not. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions, he was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. And with his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and he was afflicted. Yet he opened not his mouth like a lamb that is led to slaughter and like a sheep that before its shears is silent, so he opened not his mouth. Where do we hear these, that, that uh, verse 7 again? In the New Testament. Sorry? No? Someone's reading it. <coughs> huh? No? He's in a chariot and he's reading this. The Ethiopian eunuch. He's reading this and, he, and then he asked a question to Philip. says, who is he talking about? Is he talking about himself or someone else? And then it, that's when it says that Philip began at that same scripture and preached to him Jesus. Okay? Yeah. He was actually reading from the Old Testament scriptures here in this particular verse. Uh, so you can, you can see here how, how Isaiah chapter 53 does that. Uh, you'll see it all, you know, throughout all of these, 
later chapters, you know, the, the reference to Christ and his suffering, how he is the propitiation for our sins. Uh, he is the eternal covenant of peace. 55 is another big one, showing the compassion of the Lord. Uh, 56 talks about salvation for foreigners. 57 talks about the feudal idolatry. Uh, 58 goes into true and false fasting. 59 is evil and oppression. And then chapter 60 talks about the future glory of Israel. <clears throat> All right, key phrases and, and word. Uh, salvation, it's found actually found 28 times here in the, the book of Isaiah. And then the Holy One of Israel. If you turn back to chapter 1 and verse 4. Ah, sinful nation, a people laden with iniquity, offspring of evildoers, children who deal corruptly. They have forsaken the Lord. They have despised the Holy One of Israel. They are utterly estranged. Estranged, yeah. Okay, so again, you can see how Isaiah, just like the Bible is, is laid out for us, the beginning part of it is a lot of history and a, a foreseeing of something coming in the future. And then the later books the prophecies about Jesus and about his the salvation that he's going to bring and we see that you know the the Bible broken up that way uh, in similar in similarity uh, Christ in Isaiah so we we talk about uh, Isaiah does anybody know what another name for it or a reference to it it's called the or Isaiah himself is the, which prophet is he? The Messianic prophet. Okay, because he prophesied so much about the Messiah. Okay, so Isaiah is referred to as the Messianic prophet. Uh, so in chapter 4 and verse 20, it talks about he is the branch of the Lord. Uh, in chapter 7 verse 14, uh, it, it's given the name Emmanuel. Uh, chapter 9 and verse 2 is the illuminator, a reference there to he's going to bring light and, to, uh, and knowledge. Uh, in chapter 11 and verse 1, who will be from the branch of David, talking about his ancestry. A tried stone, uh, chapter 28 and verse 16. Uh, glory to the Lord, chapter 40 and verse 5. God's elect, chapter 42, verse 1. Uh, wise, righteous servant, chapter 42, verse 1, 52, 13, and 53, 11. He's the light of the Gentiles in chapter 42, 6 and 7. The arm of the Lord in 53 and 1. A tender plant, 53, 2. Root out of dry ground. Uh, these we just recently read uh, this evening. Uh, chapter 53, verse 2, man of sorrows, 53, verse 3, a witness to the people, 55 and 4, and holy one of Israel, 55, verse 5. All right, so the outline of the book, uh, prophetic, uh, chapters 1 through 35 and 39, or 36 through 39, these are historic pr prophecies. And then we get to, from 39 on, the 40 through, 40 through 66, the last 27 books are talking about the Messiah and his deliverance, him being the deliverer, uh, bringing salvation to, the, to all nations. Prophecies about Christ uh, that, that, we are, that are found in Isaiah. Uh, 
is the first advent, chapter 9 and verse 6 and 28, 16. Uh, and then you'll see it being fulfilled in Matthew chapter 1, verses 21 through 23. Uh, the virgin birth, uh, which was prophesied in chapter 7, verse 14, and chapter 11 and verse 1. And that matches up with uh, Matthew chapter 1 and Luke chapter 1. Uh, the adoration by the Magi in chapter 60 and verse 3 and verse 6. And then that coincides with uh, Matthew chapter 2 verse 1 and verse 2 and verse 11. The ministry to Galilee uh, is prophesied in Isaiah in chapter 9 and verse 1 and 2. And then we see the fulfillment of that in Matthew chapter 4. 13 through 16. Uh, the rejection by the Jews, chapter 8 and verse 14, and uh, that is fulfilled in Matthew chapter 12 and in John chapter 1. The acceptance by the Gentiles is prophesied about in chapter 49 and verse 6, and you see the fulfillment of that in Matthew chapter 13. <coughs> John chapter 1, 11, and 12. Uh, Jesus' mission and miracles are prophesied in uh, chapter 61, verses 1 and 2, and we see those fulfillments in Luke chapter 4, 17 through 19. He was mocked, insulted, buffeted, spit upon, scourged. Uh, chapters 50 and verse 6, chapter 52, 14, and then we see the fulfillment of those prophecies in Matthew chapter 26, verse 67, and Matthew 27, verse 30 and 31, along with Mark and Luke and John. Patience and silence under accusation, uh, that's prophesied in chapter 53, verse 7 and 9. Again, going back to that he was like, like a lamb before the slaughter. Uh, he opened not his mouth. A reference to the question that the Ethiopian eunuch asked. Uh, and then that being fulfilled in Matthew 27, verse 12. Death with the transgressor uh, is prophesied in, in chapter 53, verse 12. And then it was, we see that fulfillment in Matthew 27, verse 38. Uh, burial with the rich, uh, prophesied it in chapter 53, verse 9. And we see that fulfillment in Matthew 27, 57 through 60. Any comments about, about any of these or any of these that you'd like to look up and read? All right, a lot of prophecies here about Jesus. So, you know, I find it interesting that when Jesus came, they didn't recognize him. Right? But yet there was all these signs. When, uh, when the Magi came <coughs> and they were seeking him, they went to Herod, remember, and they... Uh, they asked where this boy king was born. And the, what did they do? They looked at the scriptures and they, were, and they found where, he was, where it was prophesied that he would be born. So they knew where he was going to be born. Okay? Knew that he was going to be born of a virgin. Knew all these, all these things about it. Jesus was the only one that fit all those things. But yet we have, there are religious groups out there that say, no, he's not the Messiah. He's not the Son of God. We're waiting on someone else. You know, no one else fits all these prophecies. All right, uh, historical prophecies. Judah's deliverance from Syria and Israel. That was prophesied in uh, chapter 7, verses 
4 through 7. Judah being invaded by Syria, uh, chapter 8, verse 4, and uh, 17, 1 through 14. The defeat of the Philistines, uh, chapter 14, verses 28 through 32. And the destruction of Moab in chapters 15 and 16. Subjection of Tyre, uh, chapter 23, verses 1 through 12. Hezekiah's life extended 15 years in uh, chapter 38, verse 5. Why was Hezekiah's life extended? Anybody remember? Remember that story? He was told that his life was, you know, get your house in order. It's, it's time. And he prayed and asked. He says, I'm not ready. You know, there's things that I need to get straightened. And he asked for 15 years, additional years. And God granted him those 15 years. And that's a, that's a great lesson right there. You know, if, if we were given additional time... What would we do with that time? You know, it's easy to say, well, boy, you know, if, if I was given additional time, I would do this and this and this and this and this. And then you turn around and you say, okay, you have today. What are you doing with today? Oh. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, he, that he asked for it. But, I mean, we make excuses like, oh, I'm too busy to do this or do that. And but yet we would say, oh, if I was given more time, I would do da 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 da. Well, we're given this time right now. Are we just saying that that we're just wasting our time because we're not doing the things that we that we would be doing if we knew that you know tomorrow was our last day or that next year or that we only had five years left, we would we would do things differently then we're not doing what we should be doing on a day-to-day -day basis because we should always be preparing, making good use of our time. <clears throat> and I'm stepping on my own toes there, too. <laughs> Babylonian captivity uh, was prophesied about in chapter 39, verses 5 through 7. Cyrus to be the deliverer from Babylon... What did uh, Cyrus do? Remember? He made the proclamation to let the people go back, to rebuild the city of Jerusalem. Okay? But that was prophesied that, that he would do that. Uh, Babylon's defeat by the Medes, and then the final destruction of, of Babylon. In chapters 13, 17 through 23. All right, miracles or out of the ordinary events. Uh, the defeat of Shennacherib uh, to show the power of prayer as a mighty weapon. You know, do we always look at prayer as being a mighty weapon? We, we tend, to, tend not to. Most, many times it's like prayer is like our last resort. It's like we put forth all this effort doing the, all these things, and then if nothing else works, well, then I'll pray. You know, we ought to start with prayer, do what we can, and, and be praying all along. You know, help me to do the best that I can, and, and, and then just, you know, have them working hand in hand. You're doing everything that you can do, and you're asking God to help you where you fall. Uh, Hezekiah healed and his life extended for 15 years. We, we discussed that already. Unfortunately, it was during these 15 years that Manasseh was born of Hezekiah. He turned out to be the most wicked king of the southern kingdom would ever know. He also failed to glorify God before heathen uh, dignitaries, though God had healed him. All right, proving Isaiah. Uh, recent excavations beneath the present temple site reveal a secret tunnel 
dig under the so-called stables of Solomon, which led to the treasure house of the temple where valuables were stored. Also uncovered were the royal tombs where the monarchs of Israel were buried. Their graves had been cleared and moved to the slope of the Mount of Olives. Uh, King uh, Isaiah's tombstone, and, uh, and I, it's discussed in Isaiah chapter 6 and verse 1, has been found. Its inscription reads, Hither were brought the bones of Isaiah, king of Judah. Do not open. Uh, king Sargon of Assyria, in chapter 20 and verse 1, Isaiah's mention of Sargon was the only record of this king for centuries and was ridiculed by critics of the word of God. In unearthing a place at Khorzbad in ancient Mesopotamia, bricks in the palace were found to be inscribed, and they read, I, Sargon, have built this palace to the praise of mine own name. This record also mentions Azuri. Another monument mentions even the number of Israelites taken captive when the northern kingdom fell. 27,290 were taken captive. All right, scientifically in Isaiah, uh, there's a great distance or height to the stars is, is mentioned in there, uh, but yet... Uh, Job mentioned the lofty nature of the stars as well in Job chapter 22 and verse 22. This inference here uh, is that it was a very long way to the stars and it was not confirmed until about 1838 uh, when it was first computed by Bezel. Okay. Substances, measures, and weights, and uh, substances, measures, and weights, chapter 40 and verse 12. It hasn't been too many years since our chemists have discovered that all substances to combine chemically must be weighed or measured. This is called isotonic balance or equilibrium. How many of y'all have had chemistry? <laughs> a few. <laughs> Don't ask me a chemistry question. But you have to have... A certain number of elements of this kind will combine with a certain number of elements of another kind. Okay, so you've got to have the right combination for them to uh, to combine. And, and it's those loose electrons that are out at the out at the outer edge that that are looking for equilibrium. So when you have these uh, isotonic uh, elements they'll combine that way so you'll you'll see like h h n h 2 o is two hydrogen molecules with an oxygen molecule the oxygen has six covalent uh elements out of the outer end it's trying to get to eight well you hydrogen has one uh element uh one atom so electron at, at its outer side so two of those gives it the, with the oxygen, gives it a full eight. So you see that that's, you know, then it's happy there. So that's a stable uh, configuration. You'll see also like sulfates where you've got a, an SO4 uh, and, you know, different combinations you, that you'll see that are common. It's because of that, you know, getting that balance chemically. If you throw the wrong number of, of things together, they're not going to combine. All right, and then the circle of the earth, more literally the roundness of the earth, uh, is talked about in chapter 40 and verse 22. Isaiah wrote this statement in about 700 B.C., Yet it was only when Magellan sailed around the world in 1475 that it was generally believed that the earth was round. Uh, again, you know, there was that common thought or belief that the earth was flat. And you, you go far enough out and you would just fall off the end. Okay? But yet the, uh, the Bible here in Isaiah uh, said that the earth was round you know, thousands of years ago. All right, 
that covers everything that's, that's on the snapshot. Anybody have any questions about the book of Isaiah? Or want to make any comments about it? I know we went over things kind of quickly there. Uh, you know, the, the biggest thing that you want to remember is, you know, Isaiah is a book that is full of messianic prophets or prophecies. Okay? You'll see a lot about uh, the coming of Jesus and, you know, the names that he would wear, where he came from, how he was treated, where he was buried. You know, the, the whole gamut is run there in the book of Isaiah. And then going back to where we started off, again, looking at the, the books of the Old Testament. How many books of the law are there? Five books of law. Books of history, there are 12 books of history. Books of poetry, there are five books of poetry. Major prophets, five. Minor prophets, 12. All right, good. So uh, you learned a little bit there. You add all those up and you get how many in the Old Testament? 39. In the whole Bible, there are 66. In the New Testament, 27. All right. Thank you, guys. For those who would like to, turn uh, with me to the text we'll use tonight, Galatians 5, starting with verse 19. Galatians 5.19. This next week, we will be engaged in Bible camp. And in Bible camp will be 100 to 125 kids, probably 50 or more staff of all sorts, and will all be contained in basically 20 acres of property, a fourth or so of that is swamp and woods, so we won't be using that. And we will be expecting everyone to get along in a very wonderful way. And I must say, for many, many years, the young people and the adults and everybody, for the most part, enjoys their time at camp. And by the time the camp's over, we just don't even want to leave because it's so much easier to be good there than it is to come out into the world and be influenced by so many things. But tonight, I'd like to spend our time comparing two things, just two simple things, and take this and, and in your mind apply it to those folks who are going to be up at camp. Then, of course, after we're done, compare it to everything. <clears throat> and this is Paul talking to the church that meets in Galatia. Now, the, and he's comparing the works of the flesh, that's number one, the works of the spirit, number two, A or B, one or two. We're going to pet, compare on the scales. Which is better for each individual one of us here or up at camp. Is it better that I, the people around me, follow the works of the flesh or the works of the spirit? Now we're up at camp, we're going to have very young people who don't understand some of these words. And those of us that are teachers are going to try to help them understand to the best of their ability what's going on, what each of these words mean. And there will be some of us there that are old like me that have been through this a number of times and still have a hard time with parts of it. I think we'd get better, but not so much for me anyway, hopefully for y'all, but we're going to compare these two things. Now the works of the flesh are evident. Apparently you don't even have to look around hard, you notice them pretty quickly. Let's see what they are. Sexual immorality. I can recognize that. Impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, revelries, dissensions, divisions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, 
and things like these. I warn you, as I warned you before, that those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. That's on the one side. That doesn't sound very good to me so far, but let's see what the other side is. What are we offered by God on the other side? But the fruits of the Spirit is joy. That sounds like a good thing. Peace, love. Should have started with love, I'm sorry. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. Would there have to be a law that says you need to love? There is a law, but it doesn't have to be there if it, you know, that's a, just a better choice. Against such things there is no law, and those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh, cut it off, done away with it, with its passions and desires. If we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoke one another, envy one another. <clears throat> so, up at camp, we're going to try to be helping people. We'll, and how do we do that? We encourage each other. Pretty much, we're all together almost all day and all night, too. And it's much easier if someone's encouraging me to be good and they're right there by my side doing whatever I'm doing and they're encouraging me to good, be good, that's much easier. Now, in class, in our Bible class, Sunday and then tonight, we were studying this and we never made it all the way through because oftentimes, well, I feel this way and I feel that way. And so we had a difficult time uh, getting all of our minds going in the same direction. So I'm asking tonight also for parents and grandparents and that sort of thing to, to help bring this to mind with your kids. And then we'll, of course, be bringing it to their minds uh, through camp. And hopefully by the end of whatever, we'll all be able to say, I love being together with my brothers and sisters in Christ because things are so nice. But for that to happen, we have to do away with all those works of the flesh. In other words, we can't pick on each other. Not the older ones picking on the younger ones, or the younger ones picking on the older ones, or picking young to young, old to old. We have to do the right things. And so I would want us to look at these things. I believe, and I think everyone can agree, that it's better if we get along well together and provoke each other to good rather than provoke each other to the bad things. Tonight, if there's anyone here who needs the prayers of the congregation for support or help, or if there's anyone here, there's not many of us here, but if there were to be someone here who is not put on Jesus Christ in baptism, this is a very wonderful time to come forward and make that wish known, and it can be taken care of. The water is, is clean and nice up there and ready to go so, so that someone could do that. If that's the needs, come forward and let your needs to be known tonight. Wait a minute.